Escape from Giant's Crown. Chapter 1. The Toe. The rain-soaked hovels and makeshift huts outside of the toe of the great stone giant were no more welcoming than the harsh cold rain of the dark forest. From the moment Olaf approached carrying the wounded Moonkin child, a mob of beggars gathered like flies to a picnic. They clawed at his clothing, but he only pulled Mao all the closer and forced his way through the rabble, holding his breath against the stench of muck and unwashed armpits. They stared at him with cavernous eyes, their hair matted and faces caked with dirt. It seemed hard to believe that they were ever more civilized, but their tattered suit coats and torn hats implied that they'd once been more than they were now. Please, sir, anything you can spare, groaned one of the hobos with a bulbous nose, followed by similar requests from a man with an eye patch dressed in ragged clothing. The wild-eyed old men pawed at Olaf's coat, nearly pulling Mao out of his arms. There were so many of them that they tumbled over each other in their desperation. They paid no mind to the injured boy in his arms. Food, a hobo with a paper hat on his head pleaded, or a muffin, eh? said another one, adjusting his cracked monocle. Have you got anything to eat? asked a small man with a ragged top hat. But Olaf declined the requests. Edging through the crowd, he clutched Mao to his chest and tried hard not to trip over any of the pots, pans, broken chairs, and various other rusted metal parts that lined a pathway through the junkyard leading up to the gated tower beside the leg. The hobos pulling at them tripped over Bartol and stepped on his tail. The dog whimpered and hung his head low, but stuck by Olaf's heels. A loud buzz blared out from the sky, and red flashing lights descended along the shaft where the elevator screeched along its rails to the platform station. As the elevator carriage slowed, a stubby arm reached out the window and upended a bucket of slop down into a feeding trough. This triggered the hobos into a frenzy. They rushed to the trough and slopped up what looked like old potato stew. Thankful for the distraction, Olaf darted out of the crowd toward the elevator shaft. If the lights above the cloud were any indication, there was a bustling city above the scrap heap. If there was a city, there would be a doctor. The enclosure around the elevator station was quite large and heavily gated with wooden planks and metal bars. He looked up through the pouring rain and the latticed planks of the elevator as it descended into the base of the platform. Its brakes screeched until hydraulics woofed and the carriage slammed into its latches. Beside the gate where Olaf stood, an illuminated red bell hung next to a small sliding door at eye level. Yanking on the cord, he rang it hard until it was interrupted. All right, all right, I hears ya, came a voice from the other side of the gate. The gate latch clattered and footsteps pattered. Then came the scrape of something heavy shoved across the wooden flooring. Soon after, the small latch door slid open, and a sniveling doorman wearing a torn top hat poked his nose through the grating from the other side. Oi, what do you want then, eh? This here bell is for paying customers only, said the doorman. Far from a natural tone, his accent was so thick that it seemed that he was trying to sound more sophisticated than he actually was. Oh, thank goodness. Listen, I need your help, Olaf nodded towards the moonkin in his arms. My boy, he needs a doctor. The doorman struggled to look down at them through the small slit in the door and replied by slamming it shut. Paying customers only. Olaf rang the bell again until the latch clicked open once more. Uh... Two, please, he said awkwardly, not knowing what to say. Then he looked down at Bartol. Uh, two and a half, I mean. Right, right. Uh, that'll be five penny each. Ten penny? Olaf's temper finally erupted. You gotta be kidding me. Can't you see this boy is injured? Oi, but I don't make them rules. I'm just a doorkeep, see? Oh, and your maths is all off. It'll be fifteen penny, he said smugly. For the three of you. Olaf grabbed the doorman by the sliver of his tie that stuck through the hole and pulled him against the opening with such a force that it squeezed his nose through the opening like a moist sponge. I don't have time for this, Olaf growled. This boy, my boy, is going to die. Do you understand? Ooh, 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 squeaked the doorkeep through puckered lips. No need to get rowdy. It's not as if I have any say in the matter. Just pay the fee and you'll be on your way then. The doorman squirmed as Olaf relaxed his grip. Fine, it's highway robbery, but I'll do it, he thought. We'll figure something out later. He sat Mao beside the gate and rummaged through his inner coat pocket for his coin pouch, but it was no longer there. Gone, he cried, checking every known pocket he had. He scanned the floor around him. Had it fallen out somewhere along the way? But where? The beggars. A crowd had huddled near one of the metal shacks. Olaf stormed straight over, eyeing each one of them. They studiously avoided eye contact. The monocle man whistled himself a tune. Olaf snatched off his hat, and when he did, a small stack of four Tuxen gold pennies slid right off of his bald head. Oi, oi, there's my penny! 
the monocled beggar insisted with a toothless smirk. Furious, Olaf caught the money pouch as it fell from the beggar's sleeve when he lowered his arm. The engraving on the pouch had Olaf's name stitched into the side, but it was now completely empty. And I suppose this is yours as well. The stranger only shrugged. Olaf glanced back at the station where Mausat propped against the latched gate, while Bartol growled at the mob. Each passing moment brought Mao closer to his end. Please, he said, looking at the cold faces around him. Can't someone help us? Oi, can't someone help us? Came a reply from the crowd. We're hungry, don't you know? Hungry? Hungry? My boy is dying. But they did not seem to take any interest. It rather seemed that they were only concerned with their own needs, despite the life or death situation. That money, he pleaded. It's all that I have left to save him. Silence fell over the crowd as all but one of them turned away. At there's a uh, nice coat you got, said the old man with the feathered cap. He smacked his lips greedily. Without a thought, Olaf threw his arms out of his coat and held it in front of him as an offering. Take it, for only... He did the math quickly in his head. Twenty-five penny. This is only a fraction of what was in his pouch when they'd arrived, but it was all that he needed, plus a little extra. I'll give you seventy, said the old toothless beggar. They both knew that Olaf, being the stranger, had no choice in the matter. Done. Olaf grabbed the stolen coins and ran back to shove the fifteen pieces of gold through. The doorkeep snatched it out of his hand and gave an excited whistle. The doors behind Olaf slammed shut, blocking anyone but them from advancing up through the platform gate. Large gears and ropes began to work, rotating open the enormous wooden doors in front of them, as the doorman, who was surprisingly small, waddled across the platform, chewing on the metal to test its integrity. Olaf quickly lifted Mao back into his arms and wrapped his scarf around them both. Bartol followed just behind. The clanging contraption made such a racket that as they stepped onto the rickety elevator platform, Mao awoke and muttered, Is everything all right? Everything's going to be fine, Mao. Just hang in there, Olaf said. Where are we? Crescent Isle? Ah, not quite. But uh, we made it, kiddo. We made it to Giant's Crown. Olaf's words weren't much comfort. But it did not matter. Mao's eyes were already closed again. He was fading. The doorkeep waddled inside and stood next to them. Dindle was written on the tattered name tag just above the doorman's jacket pocket. Below that were three polished pins, each shaped like a peach and carefully aligned. Clearly these were a point of pride, as the old suit that he wore was patched in several places and quite faded. He stood no more than a few feet off of the ground and utilized a slender top hat and platforms to present himself as taller than he actually was. He hopped onto a small wooden crate in the corner of the elevator compartment. Then he pulled a feathered cord in front of the control panel, which rung a bell. He pressed a green button, and the elevator door clicked along the interlocking track, sealing them inside. Sorry about all that, Mayor Byron's orders and all. Dindle flipped the latch to lock the door railing in place. When he pulled the main lever, the wooden encasement rattled to life as the mechanisms engaged. The rails connected to the small wheels in each corner, and the elevator lifted them up beyond the giant's foot and along the crooked leg. Olaf slid the remaining two coins into his left pocket. His stomach groaned as he looked up through the holes between planks in the roof of the elevator where the rainwater poured through the slats. But all he could make out were the ascending lattices reaching into the blackness and the faint city lights. The rain pattered against the roof, and it was almost peaceful, except for the rickety hum and clank of the motor. His eyes were heavy, too. His feet were cold, and every loose pebble in his boot pinched him. He took a deep breath and tried to stop the nervous shaking in his knees. As the carriage ascended, Olaf slumped to the floor beside Bartol. He fought to keep his eyes open, but the last thing that he recalled was the flashing of blurred light through the joints and lattices of the elevator, and the rhythmic churning of gears as they ascended into the storm. A buzz startled him awake. Dindle spoke into a small cone-shaped device. Yes, that's right. Three of them. Uh, yes, sir. He glanced over at his new guests, who all lay passed out in the corner of the elevator. Oh dear, look at them's. Not one of them's gonna make it, is they? 